Price vient de l'Université de Sydney. Il est euh, surtout euh, spécialiste du temps. Il dirige le centre de recherche sur le temps à l'Université de Sydney. Et euh, il a aussi travaillé beaucoup sur la causalité et euh, d'autres notions de physique. Et aujourd'hui, il prend euh, des reculs par rapport à ces concepts particuliers euh, et plus généralement de la conception naturaliste. Voilà, je vous laisse la parole. Thank you, Max, um, and I'm very delighted to be here in this um, distinguished institution. Um, the talk I'm going to give you is based on a paper of mine of the same title, which is coming out in a volume called Naturalism in Question, edited by two people. One of them is a colleague of mine in Sydney, a man called David MacArthur. The other is a man called Mario De Caro from Rome. Uh, it's coming out from Harvard University Press and I think is due out next month. And so um, this is a talk I've given in a number of places, but this is certainly going to be the last time I'm going to be able to give, give it because the book is coming out. Um, as the title of the book, Naturalism in Question, suggests, on the whole it's uh, a book by people who see themselves as opponents of naturalism. Um, I don't see myself as an opponent of naturalism. I think of myself as a, uh, as a naturalist, but I am, as you'll see in this talk, I am an opponent of, of what many people mean when they think of themselves as naturalist in contemporary philosophy. So the first thing I want to do is to distinguish between Two, two very different ways of being a philosophical naturalist, two ways of taking science seriously in philosophy. I suppose if you wanted, a, if you wanted the, the most basic kind of characterization of what it is to have a naturalistic attitude in philosophy, it involves a combination of two things. One is the view that the concerns of natural science and the concerns of philosophy overlap in some way, that they're not simply completely separate disciplines. And also, and this is what makes it naturalistic, the view that where they overlap, there's a sense, some sense in which science takes priority. Okay, but from that, from that basic starting point, here are two very different things that might be meant by naturalism. The first is the view I call object naturalism. Now there are many different sort of, there, there are many different characterizations of this. Um, it's essentially the view that well, it tends to come in both metaphysical and epistemological forms. In, in a metaphysical form, it's the view that in some sense all there is to reality is what's studied by science. In an epistemological mode, it's the view that the methods of science are in some sense um, some sense, something like the view that all knowledge is scientific knowledge, something of that kind. Okay, so that, that's what I'm going to call object naturalism. And I want to contrast it with what I'll call subject naturalism. Subject naturalism is the view that we humans are natural creatures, and in particular, the view that human thought and talk is part of the natural world, part of what's properly studied by science. Now, what's the relationship between these two sorts of views, object naturalism and subject naturalism? And in particular, is the second one, subject naturalism, just a kind of corollary or special case of the first one? And I want to argue that it isn't. I want to argue that there's a very important sense in which subject naturalism is theoretically prior to object naturalism. And the priority stems from the fact that object naturalism, at least in the philosophically interesting cases, object naturalism presupposes a particular view of human linguistic activity, roughly what I'll call a, a representational or a referential view. As a view about human language, 
this presupposition is one which properly forms, falls within the domain of subject naturalism. In other words, it's a presupposition which is properly assessed from a subject naturalist standpoint. And so that leads to the first of two theses that I'm going to defend, the thesis I call the priority thesis. The priority thesis says that there's an important sense in which philosophy needs to begin with subject naturalism. Naturalistic philosophy needs to begin with subject naturalism because object naturalism depends on validation from a subject naturalist perspective. Whereby validation, what I mean is having these representationalist presuppositions confirmed by a good theory of human linguistic behavior. Okay, so the basic idea so far is that object naturalism in practice, in philosophically interesting cases, depends on these representationalist presuppositions. If we're naturalists about human thought and talk, those are presuppositions which are properly assessed from a subject naturalist standpoint. So that provides an important sense, I want to argue, in which subject naturalism is theoretically prior to object naturalism. Now, it's one thing to, it's one thing to, to show that there's um, this relationship of priority. It's another thing to show that this is, in any sense, a cause of concern for object naturalists. But I think that there are good reasons for thinking that object naturalism fails this test. And so the second thesis I'm going to defend is this one, the, what I'll call the invalidity thesis. And it says that there are strong reasons for doubting whether object naturalism deserves to be validated in the sense I outlined above. In other words, there are reasons for being skeptical about these representationalist presuppositions on which object naturalism depends. What makes object naturalism a philosophically interesting thesis in contemporary philosophy is that there are a whole range of cases in which it's difficult to see how we're going to place some subject matter within a naturalistic worldview. And all sorts of issues in contemporary philosophy are issues of this kind. What's the place of mind in the physical world? Or what's the place of value in the physical world? Or what's the place of abstract objects in the physical world? So there's this very characteristic kind of problem which arises from an object naturalist perspective. How do we locate a certain domain? A domain in which we appear to be talking about entities or properties of a certain kind. How do we locate that domain within a naturalistic worldview? And following Frank Jackson, I'll call those sorts of issues placement problems. Now, I want to distinguish more carefully than people normally do between two conceptions of where those problems originate, two conceptions of the source of placement problems. On one conception, which I call the material conception, placement problems have to be thought of initially as problems about the nature of objects or entities of a certain kind. So problems of the form, what is value? Or what is causation? What is meaning? And I want to contrast that material conception with what I'll call the linguistic conception. Now, according to the linguistic conception, placement problems are not initially problems about the object, as it were. So the initial problem in the case of, say, value is not the problem, what is value, but a linguistic problem, a problem about human linguistic usage. It's the problem, what are we humans doing when we use evaluative terms, terms like good and bad? So the linguistic conception of the origin of a placement problem 
holds that these problems originate as problems about human linguistic usage. So in some very general sense, that, that the problem is always the problem as to what we humans are doing when we use a certain group of terms or concepts. What I'm going to do is to assume for the moment that the linguistic conception of the placement problems is the right one. And on that basis, argue for the priority thesis and the invalidity thesis. And then I'm going to come back to the issue as to whether, um, whether the, the conclusions that I've come to, namely the priority thesis and the invalidity thesis, I come back to the issue as to whether those conclusions can be avoided by adopting the material conception of where these problems start. And I'll, I'll give you some reasons for thinking that that's not the case. At the moment, then, I'm assuming that placement problems are initially problems about human linguistic usage. What turns a concern about a particular aspect of human linguistic usage into a concern about apparently non-linguistic entities such as causation or value or numbers or whatever. How do we get from the a linguistic problem, a problem about human linguistic usage, to a problem about objects or entities or properties of a certain kind? And the answer is that we get there by what I'll call the representationalist assumption. The assumption that the bits of language that we, we were looking at have the linguistic function of representing or standing for or referring to something. So what happens is that this, represent, this representationalist assumption, it shifts our theoretical focus from a focus on the language, on the use of the terms or on the occurrence of the concepts, to something in reality. So the, the representationalist assumption provides a kind of bridge which leads our theoretical, our theoretical gaze from one point to another. So it leads our theoretical gaze from a concern about the terms to a concern about their apparent object. And using or adapting Quine's terminology, we can call this shift, this shift of theoretical focus, a semantic descent. So what's happening is a semantic relation of some kind, such as reference or truth, is providing a kind of ladder which is leading us from a second order issue about language, about the use of particular terms, to a first order issue about non-linguistic reality. But it's important to see that this shift of focus here has to be a genuine logical descent. It can't be a mere reversal of Quine's very deflationary notion of semantic ascent. Quine's semantic ascent, as I put it here, never really leaves the ground, is one of Quine's famous statements about one of the passages in which Quine is given voice to very deflationary views about notions like truth. Quine says, by calling the sentence snow is white true, we call snow white. The truth predicate is a device of disputation. In other words, Quine is saying that when we say snow is white is true, we're still talking about snow. We're not really talking about the sentence, the linguistic item, snow is white. So for Quine then, talking about the referent of a term X or the truth of a sentence X is F, is just another way of talking about 
the object X. Now think about what this means if we're interested in this project of getting from an initially linguistic concern, a concern about the uses of certain terms, to a concern about non-linguistic reality. If we tried to get across that gap using Quine's deflationary semantic notions, we wouldn't have got across the gap at all. We'd have, we'd have just changed the subject. Because when we're using those Quinean deflationary semantic notions at one end, we're just talking about linguistic reality. We're not in any sense taking up the issue we had at the beginning, which was an issue about the use of particular terms. So in other words, if we try to combine a linguistic conception of where these placement problems start, that is, if, if we think that placement problems are initially problems about the human use of terms like value and cause and number and so on, if we combine that view with a deflationary view of truth and reference, then the object naturalist is committing a kind of fallacy of equivocation in shifting his focus from the concern about the use of the words to a concern about non-linguistic reality. It's a kind of, it's a kind of mention use confusion. And one way to see that is to see that we, if we start with this linguistic issue about the use of particular terms, to, to, to raise that issue, we don't, don't need to use those terms ourselves. We can adopt a kind of anthropological standpoint. We can say, well, what's going on when these creatures use these, utter these sounds? So that's the kind of question that we can, we can phrase, we can raise that question without using the terms concerned ourselves. But if we want to apply Quine's deflationary notions of truth and reference to those terms, then we are actually using those terms. What Quine says about snow is white is true, being another way of talking about snow, just doesn't make sense unless you see that the, the term snow is actually being used there and not simply mentioned. Okay, so the, the basic point here is that if you're an object naturalist and you think that these placement problems originate as problems about linguistic usage, then you need something stronger than deflationary notions of truth and reference to shift your theoretical focus from this issue about the use of particular terms to an issue about um, the corresponding non-linguistic objects. No, there's a, there's a delicate kind of balancing act that um, has to be performed here because if we're going to get from an issue about the use of a particular term X to an issue about X itself, then it's vital that what gets us from one place to the other have the disputational property. The reason we end up being interested in X having started with a, an interest in the use of the term X, is, as we want to put it intuitively, that the term X refers to X. In other words, the intuition is the intuition which is um, at the heart of the disputational property. But the point I've just made is that unless our semantic notions somehow thicker or more substantial than simply disquotational notions. They don't lead us, they don't lead our theoretical gaze from one place to the other, from a concern about language to a concern about reality. What happens is simply we forget about that linguistic issue and take up another issue in the material mode. 
Okay, so if the only notions, if the only semantic notions we've got are the deflationary ones, then we can't get from the linguistic starting place, which is where the placement problems arise on the linguistic conception, to a material issue. Now, maybe that's a good thing. Maybe we were wrong to think that the placement problems were ever linguistic problems in the first place. Maybe we should have said, look, the problem about causation is always what is causation, not what's going on when we use the term cause. The problem about value is always what is value and not what's going on when we use the term value. But remember, we're working under the assumption for the moment that the linguistic conception of the starting point is the right one. So under that assumption, the conclusion is that we need something stronger than merely discretational semantic notions to get us from that linguistic starting point to the kind of material issues which typically preoccupy object naturalists. Problems like what is causation, what is value. And that's what I mean at the end of this slide then by saying that given a linguistic conception of where placement problems start, semantic notions play a crucial role in the foundations of object naturalism. Without them, we simply don't get to the material issues about the, the natural place or location of non-linguistic entities. That's why subject naturalism comes first. In other words, that's why we have what I'm calling the priority thesis. Assuming, as we are for the moment, assuming a linguistic conception of where these placement problems start, what I've argued is that object naturalism thus turns out to rest on substantial theoretical assumptions about what we're doing with language. Assumptions which need to be cashed out in terms of thick, non-deflationary semantic notions. So effectively, it's the assumption that substantial semantic relations of some kind are going to end up being part of the best scientific theory of human thought and talk. Now, one way in which that could fail to be the case is if it turned out that, according to the best scientific theory of human thought and talk, the right interpretation of the semantic notions like truth and reference was a deflationary one. Okay, so given a linguistic conception of um, the origin of placement problems, object naturalism depends on these depends on what on my first slide I call the representationalist thesis. It's a, it's a thesis about what we're doing with language. And the important point here is that it's a thesis which is properly assessed from the standpoint of subject naturalism. And moreover, it, it's something that we're not entitled to a priori. It's something which, um, as it were, has to wait on the deliverances of linguistic theory. And so that's the basis of what I call the priority thesis. It seems to me that object naturalism depends on validation from a subject naturalist perspective. Now, it's one thing to 
it's one thing to um, establish that that's the case. It's another thing to show that that's in any sense a cause for concern for object naturalists. And is there any reason for doubting that object naturalism should be validated in this sense? And I want to mention three reasons which seem to me to provide some case for pessimism. That is, some reasons for thinking that there's at least grounds for doubt as to whether object, naturalist is in, object naturalism is entitled to these representationalist presuppositions. And the first is really just the, the possibility or the appeal of deflationist views about truth and reference. We've already seen that if deflationism is right about truth and reference, then object naturalism is in trouble because there's nothing to take our theoretical gaze from a linguistic issue, an issue about the use of certain terms to a supposedly corresponding issue about non-linguistic reality. Two notes about that. One is that the Palacios views of truth and reference are themselves subject naturalist in spirit, in my sense, because they are telling us in non-semantic terms what speakers like us are doing with terms such as true and refers. In other words, they're giving us a non-representationalist story about the function of terms such as truth and reference. So, deflationist views of truth and reference both exemplify a non-semantic approach, a thoroughly naturalistic approach in the subject naturalist sense, but a non-semantic approach and a non, an approach which isn't a naturalistic approach in the object naturalist sense. Okay, so the deflation, the deflation is views of truth and reference. In a sense, they're doing two jobs in the story I'm telling. One job they're doing is that of undermining object naturalist approaches. The other, th the other job they're doing is that of exemplifying the alternative kind of approach the sort of naturalistic approach I want to recommend. The second note here um, refers to an argument by Paul Boghossian, um, which appears in a couple of places. The most well-known one, I think, is an article called The Status of Content in, in Philosophical Review in about 1990. Now, in that article, Boghossian argues that deflationism about notions like truth and reference is incoherent. In his argument for that, he says, he says a, de a deflationist about reference, for example, must claim that the term reference doesn't refer to anything. And Boghossian says, rightly, I think, that that's incoherent. But Boghossian's argument over, overlooks the distinction between denying that the term reference refers to anything. I think he's right to point out that that's something that uh, we can't coherently do. But what, what we can coherently do is to say nothing theoretical about whether the term reference refers to anything. And I think that's something that a deflationist can coherently do. After all, a deflationist about a notion like reference is someone who thinks that the notion of reference doesn't play any interesting role in mature scientific theory about language. So the term reference just isn't a, just isn't a term which gets used in, in, a, in, in a theoretical tone of voice for deflations. So the deflationist doesn't say that the term reference doesn't refer. He just doesn't make any theoretical claims either way because he doesn't think the term reference it's a term which is used in any interesting sense in making theoretical claims 
Okay, so that's the first reason for thinking that the dependence of object naturalism on these representationalist presuppositions may turn out to be a problem. The second reason I want to give you is really just an, an adaptation of some arguments by Stephen Stitch in, um, in his book, Deconstructing the Mind. Stitch is concerned with the case of a limitivism about notions like belief and desire. And Stitch says, well, look, typically a limitivist say, a limitivist characterize their view as the view that the terms belief and desire don't refer to anything. But Stitt says, well, if that's what a limitivism is, then in order to know whether a limitivism is true, we're going to have to have an adequate notion of reference. So a limitivism is going to turn out to be a theory which we can only assess from the standpoint or making use of an adequate scientific account of reference. It's only once we have such a theory that we'll be able to determine whether the terms belief and desire and the other terms of folk psychology actually refer to anything. And Stitch argues that that's unacceptable. He says it's unacceptable that metaphysics should be hostage to the theory of language in this way. Now, although Stitch is concerned with the limitivism, the same point applies to people who are not eliminatists. If you think first, as we're assuming for the moment, that the placement problem for causation begins with the human use of the term causation, and then it becomes, it becomes a question about something material in virtue of a representationalist assumption. In other words, in virtue of the assumption that this term does the linguistic job of referring to something in the world. If that's, if that's how you set up the problem, then in order to address the question, what is causation, you're in effect addressing the question, what does the term causation refer to or pick out in the world? And, and here Stitch's point applies. If that's what's going on, if, that, if that's what kind of question it is, then you can't address the question until you've got a theory of reference. In other words, we won't know what causation is, if this is, if this is where the problem comes from. We won't know what causation is until we know more about reference. Because we simply won't be able to, in a position to investigate what the term causation refers to until we've got a theory of reference. Um, and there's, there's more to Stitch's argument than that. I mean, another element to it is the, an argument, in my view, quite a convincing argument, that, that any theory of reference is likely to be indeterminate in a way which means that there's really no way of settling these metaphysical issues if those issues have to be understood in this linguistic way. Now, Stitch responds to those, I mean, Stitch's response to these arguments is to say, well, look, the problem here is to think that these metaphysical issues were ever linguistic issues in the first place. So the problem was to think that the question was, in the case of folk psychology, the question was, do the terms belief and desire refer to anything? Stitch says that's the wrong question. The right question in the first place should have been the question, are there any beliefs and desires? So in Stitch's view, where we went wrong is just by trying to characterize metaphysical issues in these linguistic terms. In other words, in my framework, in the framework I set up at the beginning, Stitch is an example of someone who thinks that the placement problems are not linguistic problems. It's just a philosophical kind of confusion if we set them up that way. Placement problems are material problems. Now, I'm going to come back to the question as to whether we can avoid these difficulties in that way, that is, by thinking of the problems as material problems. But for the moment, I'm still working under the assumption that placement problems originate as linguistic problems. 
And if that's true, then Stitch's arguments seem to me to be big problems for object naturalists. The third kind of reason for, third sort of reason for pessimism, so the third reason for thinking that object naturalists are not entitled to these representationalist presuppositions. In a sense, it's really just Paul Bogosian's point, which I mentioned before. It's a kind of incoherence which shows up. Well, if we have a, if we have a conception of the task of philosophy in these areas, which thinks of these placement problems as arising in this linguistic way, and thinks that we can then use semantic notions to turn those linguistic problems into material problems. And Boghossian's point is really <coughs> that whole way of doing philosophy runs into problems when we try and apply it to the semantic notions themselves. Because of the, the, the sort of presuppositional or foundational role that the semantic notions are playing in the philosophical program. And one way to get at that point, I think, is to say, well, look, object naturalism set up in this way, object naturalism requires that we always acknowledge as an empirical possibility that a given term X will turn out to fail to refer. But as Boghossian notes, we can't we don't seem to be able to acknowledge that possibility for the term reference itself. Object naturalists are going to have to accept that if this is the way the problems arise, then the object naturalist framework is not applicable to the semantic notions themselves. And in a sense, that's, what, that's the conclusion that Boghossian himself derives from these arguments. Boghossian recommends a non-naturalist account of semantic notions. I'm recommending something different. I'm recommending a different kind of naturalistic treatment of semantic notions. A, and a different kind of naturalism, one which doesn't depend on, which doesn't depend on these semantic underpinnings in the way that object naturalism does. Okay, so that was the third of the three reasons. I want to give you two reasons for doubting whether a material conception of the origins of placement problems can provide a solution for object naturalism. The first reason I'll, I sum up by saying the cat is out of the bag. It's, it's already too late for an object naturalist to make this kind of move, which simply presuppose a linguistic standard starting point. They simply don't make sense if we try to think of them in material mode. Because without a premise of this kind, there's nothing to take us from the claim that a particular mental state can be identified with the occupant of a specified causal role to the conclusion that that mental state can be identified with something physical. So the role of this assumption then, this assumption amounts to the assumption that all causal roles ultimately are occupied by something physical. So if we defined our objects of interest, in this case mental states, as, as the occupants of causal roles, then this premise here is what enables us to conclude that mental states are physical things. Okay. Now suppose that we've generalized Lewis's program in the way I've been discussing, so that it applies not just to things which have causal roles, but to other kinds of things we might be interested in in metaphysics. The problem is going to be that without any single thing to play the role that causation plays in the original restricted version of the program, there can't be any analog of this crucial premise on which to base a generalized version of the argument for physicalism. If you, if you thought, go back to the, op the, the last option I considered, the option which said that when the program gets generalized from the causal cases 
to the non-causal cases, what replaces causation are semantic notions, such as truth and reference. If that's your view, and I think this is, um, this is our Wilson Frank Jackson Brown version, then it is possible that you'll be able to find some general principle to do the work that this assumption does in the original Lewis's case, in the original Lewis case. For example, if you think you're entitled to the assumption that all truths have natural or physical truth makers, then that's an assumption which, in the generalized version of the program, will produce an analog of Lewis's argument of physicalism. But that only works if the semantic notions are doing, are really doing theoretical work for you. And we're now considering the person who says that, the view of the person who says that, that nothing specific replaces causation when the program gets generalized. It, it varies from case to case. And for such a person, there's no prospect of any general principle which is going to un underpin the argument of physicalism. So, Object naturalists turn out to face a dilemma, I think. On the one hand, if they invoke substantial semantic relations, then they've got some prospect of an argument for naturalism based, for example, as I said a moment ago, on the claim that all truths have natural truth makers. But in this case, they're committed to a linguistic conception of where the problem starts. And so they face the problems I identified in the first half of the talk. On the other hand, if they don't appeal to substantial semantic relations, then they avoid, at least have some prospect of avoiding the problems identified in the first half of the talk. That is, they have some prospect of defending the view that placement problems are really material problems. But then they lose the theoretical resources with which to formulate a general argument for naturalism or physicalism. Conceived, conceived of in the object naturalist way. That is, they lose the prospect of coming up with any defense of naturalism or physicalism of a kind which generalizes the sort of Lewisian argument for physicalism about the mental. OK, that's it. Well, I think you still have what's in effect for Goshen's problem. Um, I mean, it seems to be a, a general kind of methodological commitment of an object naturalism that, I mean, at least, at least if the problem is set up in this linguistic way, so the, the problem is always a problem of the form to what does some term X refer? seems to be a methodological constraint that we always recognize that the possibility might turn out to be nothing. So it might turn out to be the case that there's nothing in the world to which our use of a particular term refers. And I think Boghossian is quite right that we can't make sense of that notion with respect to reference itself. I mean, I mean you, you, that needs to be generalized just a little bit because the semantic terms form a kind of bundle and it, if you allow yourself one of them, then you can perhaps make sense of this kind of notion with respect to one of the other ones in the bundle. Um, but, I mean, and I think what he's done is to put his finger on um, a deep difficulty which arises if we allow those notions to play this kind of foundational role in metaphysics. So this is a Would make it is it's ill conceived from the beginning because uh, the concept of re reference is so crucial, so fundamental that it couldn't turn out um, couldn't turn out that there is no natural relation corresponding to it. Whereas with all other 
uh, objects of naturalization could turn out that we just, just discover we should el eliminate them. Is that correct? Um, yes, I, I, I mean, I think that's, I mean, that, that's a nice characterization of the Goshen's point. Um, and in a sense, what it leaves you with, if you accept the point, then it leaves you with a kind of dilemma. You can be a non-naturalist about um, the semantic notions, the way that the Goshen himself wants to be. Or you can do the sort of thing I recommend. You can say, well, look, the, the, the problem is based on a, a, on a, a mistake conception of what naturalism really requires here. And the more fundamental kind of naturalism is naturalism about ourselves, and about our own, in particular, about our own linguistic and psychological um, behavior. Um, and and once, once, once you see that, then you can see that there's, um, there's, a, there's a, a thoroughly naturalistic way of making sense of what's going on here. A way which is already embodied in, in, in practice in deflationary views of truth and reference. Because, of course, those views are giving us thoroughly sort of naturalistic account of what those terms are doing in human linguistic practice. It's just not a representationalist account. But couldn't it turn out that if you, if you approach the problem in a subjective naturalist point from a subjective naturalist point of view, so you think about everything as, about, uh, as, as being problems about how to understand ourselves, what, what we are and how we make sense of the world, maybe you rediscover that in that way that um, uh, what we do with all these concepts like causation and, and truth and reference um, has, a, uh, has an analysis in terms of causational information. So maybe you, you end up thinking well, about it as about ourselves. You end up finding uh, the same naturalization that uh, you would have, you would have uh, expected as an object naturalization. Well, I mean, you, you're, you're certainly going to end up, I mean, no subject naturalist is going to, going to deny that there are a lot of relations between human thought and talk on the one hand and things in the natural environment on the other. I mean, of course, there, there, there are going to be all sorts of sort of patterns. The, the, the question is whether uh, amongst all those patterns, there's something which we ought to think of as semantic relations. Now, if I've understood you rightly, then you're saying, well, surely we ought to, from, even from a subject naturalist standpoint, we ought to leave open the possibility that the answer to that question will be yes, that when we, as it were, investigate these things. Um, and part of me wants to, wants to agree, agree with you Part of me thinks that lurking in, in this sort of area, there's an a priori reason for thinking that nothing in that pattern of relations could have all the characteristics that the semantic notions have. And so there's a reason for thinking that um, there's, a, there's something which is in some ways analogous to some of the arguments against naturalistic reductions of other notions. Like like value, for example. I mean, what's characteristic of these placement issues, in a sense, what makes them hard problems, is that in each case, the, 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 there are various sorts of reasons for thinking that the project of, of, of naturalistic reduction is a difficult one. Um, so in the case of value, for example, there's things like the naturalistic fallacy. Um, in the, in the case of, of mentality, there's the problems associated with intentionality. So, so I mean, in each of these areas, there are characteristic kinds of diff characteristic kind of difficulties which stand in the way of naturalistic reductions. Now, maybe that the lurking in this area in a way which hasn't been fully brought out is an argument of that kind for the semantic notions themselves. An argument along roughly these lines. Look, if there were to be a naturalistic 
reduction of notions of truth and reference, then it would have to be self-applicable. It would have to be applicable to investigate the semantic relations of the notions of truth and reference themselves. And yet that, that involves certain sorts of incoherencies. So that's a reason for thinking that there can't be such a reduction. So, I mean, there, there, are, there are various sorts of connections which I, I, I would like to explore, but sort of find too difficult to think about most of the time, I think. I mean, there are connections between some of this sort of stuff and Putnam's model theoretic argument. Yeah. Um, there's a different sort of approach to defending forms and logic action and so on. And I just wondered what the whether one could make a connection between the objections that you raised to the conceptions you were you that you had immediately in view and that other form of approach to logic naturalism that would illuminate why this other form Describe would also get into the Here's the approach um, that some people take. But basically, um, we have reason to believe that physics gives us a base level description of what goes on in the world. Everything else that goes on in the world is going to be supervenient on physics. <coughs> and Anything that was not supervenient on physics, we'd have to believe, was incapable of having any effect upon us at all. And certainly wouldn't be the objects of our thought. I mean, arguments that you get in, in Descartes were really not really mm -hmm. mm -hmm. um, uh, you know, If the colors weren't supervenient upon the value of objects, given that the processes that actually produce the experiences of perception are determined by physical. Base level properties of these things, colors are going to have to be supervenient upon these things. Now, does that yield the version of the thesis that everything that exists is at some level a physical object and only acts thanks at some level to its physical properties and so on? Is that a form of object naturalism? And if so, is it liable to the worries that you're raising? I think that, well, one thing I think about this is that the, the, the sort of view you're describing can itself be spelled out in two versions corresponding to my division of the beginning between a linguistic conception of the nature of place and problems and a material conception. I mean, I think, I mean, it's possible to say the kinds of things you said in staying strictly in the material mode. Um, that is, in a sense, working under the assumption that, that um, we, we're talking about color and not about human thoughts and utterances about color. Um, but there's another way of um, there's another way of, of, of sort of saying very similar things, which is couched in the linguistic mode. And I think this is something that that. Um, so something you find in, in, in Frank Jackson. I mean, supervenience plays a very central role in his argument, but it's it's um, it's very much a linguistic notion. So it's a, it's, it's it's a relation between truths, as it were. I think something thought of as a, a relation between objects. Um, now. What, what I say to, to that sort of line of argument is going to, going to depend on which of these two versions it is. If it's the second one, if it's the linguistic one, then I'm going to say, well, you're agreeing with me in the sense that the problems arise in the, this linguistic way. Therefore, you're exposed to these sorts of difficulties I've talked about here. Um, now, but if it's the material one, then... I guess the relevant thing to say is that um, there's a standard way of challenging those sorts of arguments by 
challenging a kind of metaphysical view on which they rest, namely a view which has got a kind of a, a single world containing these different sorts of ingredients, color and metaphysical stuff and so on. Now, it's certainly true that if you begin with that sort of metaphysical picture, then um, you, you get to placement worries, you get to worries about the relationship between the different bits of it. Um, but if you begin on the linguistic side, then um, you, and, and it, these are very well known rules, you have, you, you have a reason for thinking that, that that metaphysical picture is a kind of philosophical mistake because it arises from mistakes we make about language. Okay, so, so we're left then with a, I mean, the, the strongest form of opponent, presumably, is the one who said, I'm going to do this in material mode. And then your reply is, well, do we have to think that we've only got one kind of world? But he's going to reply, well, I, I, I said there's one world, but there are many layers of description of it. And, and, and then we went with it. Um. Many levels of description, but the higher levels are all supervenient. And how is the supervenient going to be cashed out? Um, well, typically something like um, you could put it in the material mode if you want, in the following way. Um, X facts are supervenient upon Y facts if it's not possible for two situations to differ in respect of X facts, or in respect of X conditions, without also differing in respect of Y conditions. <coughs> I mean, I think the, the, the strongest argument that, that my side of the debate can use at this point is an argument which says, well, if we approach these issues in a linguistic way and think about what we're doing with these different bits of language, then we get a very natural explanation of our supervenience intuitions. So, rather than being left with a kind of metaphysical mystery on the other side. Um, the sort of dialectic I'm thinking of here is the one that comes out in, um, comes out in some of Simon Blackburn stuff. I don't know if you know the, the stuff from the 70s, maybe early 80s, in which he's sort of arguing that quasi realist in his terms have, have a much better account of supervenience of, of ethical, apparent supervenience of ethical matters on non-ethical matters that the moral realist does. Um, I mean, there's a connection with, with one of the points at the end. I mean, if, it seems to me that someone who wants to think of it in the, in the sort of metaphysical way that you're describing um, has a problem with justifying the supervenience intuition. Now, they might try to justify that in, in terms of um, some sort of general argument for discipline. But my point at the end was if they try and make that general argument, a generalization of Lewis's arguments for physicists and fundamental, then they're going to run into, into the going to run into the sort of problem I identified. But, um, that they have this dilemma. The natural way of setting up those, the generalization, is one which invokes substantial semantic relation. But if they're doing that, they're implicitly buying into the linguistic conception of where these problems arise. See whether uh, the author 
resist no the step at which you say that uh, he can't espouse a deflationary conception of truth and reference based on the very strong dichotomy between those two placement problems they reject actually your strong assumption that either placement problems are bound to be linguistic and there are some consequences that are or placement problems uh, are placement problem follows that you have to be formulated in the material conception and in fact whether the Quinean kind of topic uh, naturalist could actually just reject that distinction and say look yes uh, I'm using the deflationary notion of truth and reference I'm not espousing any kind of substantial semantic notions and that seems to show that your strong dichotomy is unacceptable. So that, 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 you know, the choice that you're forced, trying to force on us between either formulating the placement problem in linguistic, in purely linguistic terms, or in the material mode, simply is reveals that that, I mean, given that it's inconsistent mm -hmm. with the deflationary view of truth and reference, I mean, one, one, one should reject your dichotomy between choosing to formulate the placement problem either in the material mode or in the linguistic mode. In fact, there is no such distinction to be made. And that's what the deflationary uh, approach to truth and reference should suggest. And I, I, I therefore, either Quinian espouse the deflationary uh, conception of truth and reference, and I reject your uh, 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 choice between the, the purely linguistic or the material way of uh, conceiving of the um, problem. Why isn't that open to the object naturalism? Okay. Um, and the the, the Quine you're thinking of would it in effect be appealing to what Quine says about semantic right. sin. So in effect they'd be arguing that look, <laughs> because of what Quine says about semantic sin, right. in fact the, the, the linguistically characterized issues and the material yeah. issue are one and the same yeah. issue. Yeah. Okay. Right. And, so, and, okay. And, and, and in fact, I mean, he starts initially with, I mean, you, you're setting up the argument that the object naturalist could not uh, accept the Quine and the because you start, I mean, you made it in the paper, you know, you, you, you kept repeating on the assumption that yeah. the right yeah. view of the okay. problem is linguistic. And I'm just saying, look, assuming the rightness of the deflationary view of truth and reference, why isn't it open to him? You say that your dichotomy is wrong-headed. Okay. Well, I want to say that there are various there are questions we can ask about um, human linguistic usage, either our, our own usage or the usage of some other group of humans, which are questions we can ask at a point in at which we're not in a position to use the terms ourselves or to apply the Quinean so deflation in notion. general objection to the deflation view. I mean, that's no, the no I don't think it's an objection to the deflation view. view. It's an objection to, I mean, if it's Quine's view, I don't really think it is well, Quine's view, but if it were Quine's view that, that um, as it were, the only theoretical standpoints are the, the sort of the material one, or what really comes to the same thing, the one we get by semantic assent, then it would be an objection to that, because it's pointing out, look, there's another kind of standpoint, there's this sort of external anthropological standpoint. That we You're mentioning their use, yeah. using the word. Yeah, I yeah. yeah. mean, after all, I mean, Quine himself is is very sharp about pointing, uh, pointing us to use mentioned distinctions. Um, <laughs> now, I mean, I think the crucial point is that, um, I mean, in order for, for what Quine says about um, semantic assent to be true, we have to understand that, that um, there's a sense in which the, the, the embedded sentence, snow is white, in the utterance, snow is white, is true. The embedded sentence is not strictly a mention because it can't be, it, it, snow is white is true, can't be equivalent to snow is white unless snow is white is, um, I don't know, as a word, 
well, one thing, it has to be the English thing, but so it has to be in some sense an interpreted thing and, and not merely a, a kind of, uh, an, not, not merely a, an, an utterance in the, in, in, the, in, in the sense it could be from an anthropological standpoint. Um, So, I mean, that's, that's the basic thing I want to say to, to resist the idea that there is only one standpoint here. Um, I mean, I suppose to fill out that answer, what, what I really need to do is to argue that what's involved in, in various existing examples of non-representationalist but non nonetheless realist approaches to particular bits of linguistic usage um, is in the relevant sense something like that anthropological perspective. Um, but I think it's, it's, it's fairly clear that that's the case. I mean, if you just think about the sorts of things that expressivists typically say about say about the genealogy of moral judgments. Um, at, at least in the early part of that story, um, the part of the story which says that, that these, these utterances begin as, as kind of primitive expressions of, of, of attitudes of approval and disapproval. And that's the kind of thing which can clearly be said from a purely anthropological standpoint. Um, now, it, 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 it gets messier once we get into the business of, of sort of explaining why those, those expressions take um, a particular kind of syntactical form which enables them to embed and all of those sorts of things. Yeah, I mean, it, I think it's, it's then quite hard to see exactly how much you can, stay, you can say and still, still continue to occupy that, that sort of sideways on perspective on human language. But I don't think there's any doubt that you can start there, and that that's the important thing. The important thing is that there's a place, that there's a way of starting, which is not the way of starting that's available, um, that's equivalent to, to the material one. Can, can I ask another, another question? I wasn't completely sure I understood the stage of the argument where. I think it was in section six, you said that a naturalist of the kind that's in your target area might try to take a generally material mode approach. And then you said, I understood correctly, that the trouble was there are just too many, I suppose, impressive and non negligible forms of so to speak, metalinguistic account out there for this to work. Well, would it do to be, here's, a, here's the idea of a first reply, there would be some cases where, let me see, one would just, I mean, the naturalist would want to say, a metalinguistic account is the right account for that, because what we've got is a certain kind of guff, which is talk, Apparently, as if there was, uh, so to speak, yeah. a factual realm yeah. to be talked yeah. about here, though in fact there isn't. And this is mythology. And in that case, you do a bit of linguistic analysis of what's going on, and you yeah. say, incidentally, it's all guff. And then, for everything else that you want to reduce, now those things are being eliminated, not reduced, and then the things that you actually believe are there then you say, yes, these are going to be reduced to the stuff that we believe to be the you know, basic building blocks, etc. So I, I don't, I, I'm not sure if there was something that ruled out that kind of position. Um, there's certainly not anything which rules it out absolutely, because after all, there, there, 
Um, th there are certainly going to be cases in which I think that's the, the right thing to do. I mean, if you're considering the relationship of chemistry to physics, that, um, I mean, I don't think that we should say, oh, well, look, chemical talk is a particular kind of discourse that has a particular function. We should investigate the, the sort of natural functions of chemical talk and forget about trying to reduce it to physics. I certainly don't want to say that. Um, so, but nevertheless, I do want to say that, as it were, once the, once the door has been opened, once the, the, the cat is out of the bag, as I put it, um, once we recognize that this is a kind of legitimate way of treating any, a legitimate possible way of treating any, any um, problematic area, then um, I don't think that, that the object naturalist can rule it out of court in any particular case. And the interesting question becomes, well, how do we decide where it's appropriate and where it's not appropriate? Now, I don't have, um, I mean, I don't have a sort of general answer to that question, and I don't think we should expect one in advance. Because it's, 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 in a sense, it's just a matter for empirical science, for the investigation of the things we do with human language. But nevertheless, I think that there's a, there's a kind of a, a sort of heuristic principle which it's helpful to rely on, which is that in those cases in which, as philosophers attempting to reduce X's to Y's, we found that there are great difficulties in doing so, that's at least a prima facie reason for thinking that it might be the case that. The reason that there are these problems is because the reduction is, is, is the wrong approach in these cases. Um, we, we should be trying this other approach. So in these cases that, that are, are sometimes called hard problems, cases of meaning and mathematics and modality and mind. And, um, I don't know why so many of them start with N. But, um, I mean, I think there's at least a prima facie reason for thinking that those are going to be cases in which this sort of non-reductive naturalism is going to turn out to have something useful to say, and, and that we should take the, 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 the kind of the well-known difficulties with alternatives as, as, as sort of some sort of evidence for that. But, but if, if I came across as suggesting that I think that, the, you know, that all cases are going to be like that, then, then, then that was misleading. Let me know how hard it is to defend ourselves. <laughs>